Welcome to the second day of the Giants Conference, guys. My name is Tip. I'm part of the Blackbird team, and I will be your host for today. We are so lucky to have Bill Tai, the master of unicorns, with us this morning. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Thank you. Um, Excited to be here. Now, for those of you who don't know, the thing that Zoom, Wish, Canva, Bitfury, Tango, and Treasure Data all have in common is Bill. He is the early stage investor in all of these companies. Half a dozen of Bill's investments are billion, multi-billion dollar companies. He has 22 IPOs under his belt, co-founder and chairman of Treasure Data, IP Infusion, and iAsia Works. And today's session is all about fundraising stories from the world's greatest founders. So this session will be more of a fireside chat, but Bill is treating us to some slides and to help us tell the story. And so ask um, your question and upvote your favorite questions on slido.com using hashtag Bill, and we'll try and answer as many questions as possible. And make sure you tweet what you've learned from the session using the hashtag Giants. Okay, let's jump straight into it. And we've brought up the slides, so I will hand it over to you, Bill. Thank you, Tim. You know, I, I should also say that uh, that there were two that you didn't mention. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually the first outside investor with Rick Baker as lead in safety culture. <clears throat> uh, how can I forget and, that? <laughs> and I am also, uh, I think you're going to have to check this with him, but I may have been the first person to commit to fund Blackbird when Blackbird started, too. Oh, wow. Yeah, but, All right. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, long story, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so that, uh, you know, Tip mentioned some of these companies uh, about uh, almost a year ago to this date, April 16th, uh, Zoom listed. And that was really kind of an amazing story because, of course, it's turned into something that is part of everybody, you know, a lot of people's lives today, but it was not an easy thing to fund in, in its time you know, in a crowded video conferencing space competing with Microsoft and Google and others, but I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, these are some of the companies that uh, the tip had mentioned. Um, I would have to say also that we're entering a really interesting time in that, you know, the world is in a bit of disarray and the financial markets are in total chaos. And actually they're straightening out a little bit, but they've been in total chaos. And all of these companies you see on this page, <clears throat> and I think Safety Culture and Blackbird and some other things, they basically got started coming out of the great the great financial crisis that happened 2009-10, and the aftermath of sort of the giant forest fire that went through that era as well. And I think you know we're gonna we're we're in that period now, where I think. It's just so much better to be starting companies after you've had a downdraft. I, I, I had actually a year ago slowed down my investing a lot in the early stage because I th I'm sure everybody that's on this this uh, call had lived through it too. In a heated market, competing for talent is hard and you get a lot of mercenaries where you're paying up for, for talent and the talent may or may not stick around, you know, and expectations are high. So it's easy to disappoint and coming out of a downturn, you're in a period where the people that are starting companies, they, they mean it. It's a, it's much more authentic. Uh, the cost structures are lower. You don't have to blow a lot of your raised money trying to get attention and, you know, buying uh, PR slots, you know, or throwing, you know, fancy cocktail parties. It's like you just build and it's a, it's just a better time. So, so I don't know how the mood is over there, but feel good about the period that we're, we're coming up to here. <clears throat> um, that period also coincided with a, a seismic shift in the way uh, I think companies were, were being built, run, formed. Um, there were so many things that, that were sort of a confluence of wonderful things happening right around that period. A little bit about my background. I, I started as a semiconductor chip designer and uh, had was in a startup. Then I went into kind of the finance side, went into venture capital almost 30, around 30 years ago. And most of the companies I funded at the beginning were semiconductor chip companies. And then as I kind of you know worked through that space, I, I had customers building on top of those products, making things out of those chips. So kind of Lego blocks, boxes made out of those Lego blocks. And then 
networks were being constructed out of the communications equipment boxes so that uh, you know there, it was kind of like Legos, boxes, internet. And then after the internet got built out, there were applications built on the user interface of that network. So that was kind of the fourth wave. So first wave you know, devices, second wave boxes, third wave networks, fourth wave interface. And then around uh, 2003, four, five, it was becoming clear that the companies that would break out in their spaces were companies that understood their data. <clears throat> and of course, this phrase, you know, data is a new oil, not oil is going to negative prices. So I don't know if this is, a, you know, a good time to have this slide, but it was very clear that data science was also a sector that was going to be important. And that was the year 2011, I founded, co-founded Treasure Data. And I remember that because I was also at that time helping to start what became West Tech Fest out in Perth that I would encourage all of you to come out to because it's really a fun conference to, you know, and it's fun to get away from the more crowded metropolitan areas and get out to the West Coast and have fun. And, and I used to run around at the start of uh, the road shows for West Tech Fest and the contest we threw with like, you know, slides on our, our data ingestion rate for Treasure Data. That company ended up getting acquired um, it was founded, <clears throat> this might be useful to read, but this was a company, talking about a founder story, I had founded a company in 1999 or 2000 called IP Infusion. It was a routing protocol company, meaning we built uh, little pieces of software out of Linux uh, that were the basic communications functions in a router. So, uh, you know, border gateway protocol, open source path first, all the things to move data around the internet. And one of my investors there was a guy from Japan named Morio Kurosaki. One day he called me and said, hey, Bill, I met this kid. He reminds me of the CTO that you had at that company I funded you at, but he works on this thing called Hadoop. I don't know what that is. It seems important. Can you tell me if it's important? And, uh, and I said, Hadoop? And it was, it basically, it's a big data arc, uh, infrastructure technology. And so this kid, I said, fly him out. And so he came to my office. And literally within 15 minutes, I took out my checkbook and wrote a check and said, Kaz, I'm starting a company around you. But uh, that, that, and that's a story that, that fits into the theme of founder stories, big market, well-timed talent that fit that category. And that became a company that a uh, year and a half ago, SoftBank bought. So by, uh, call it eight years later, seven, seven years later, <clears throat> we were ingesting seven trillion rows of data a month for our customers across lots of industries. Uh, our, our little uh, software agent, I think, was being used in over 10,000 companies. And... It uh, it was a good exit. We had only used forty million bucks, and and SoftBank bought it for six hundred million down, and another you know a few hundred million of, of earnout. So it was a very very good multiple because we never really used very much cash. Uh, this is Eric. You want? What was it about the, um, that founder that made you excited, and what did he remind you of the pre? Uh, so that founder. Okay. So when I met, yeah, when I met him. Um, it was a very funny meeting because he didn't speak English very well. And so it was very, actually quite hard to understand him. But what, when he was introduced to me, uh, I was told that he had founded what had become the world's largest Hadoop users group. And I had been looking for a way to, to do something in big data around Hadoop for about three years but just couldn't find the right people. And so in walks this kid that had been building Hadoop clusters that was running a user group that that kind of told me, well, one, he knows what he's doing. Two, people respect him. Three, he can get customers probably. <laughs> I don't know for exactly what implementation, but, but uh, I, uh, as he was presenting, it just became clear to me that he really knew what he, he really knew what to build. He knew how to use Hadoop to solve problems. And it was a space that I was interested in that I thought would be very big. And I think it's also very, very important to be able to solve a specific problem or to have a skill that you can apply to solve a specific problem because 
it makes the the spending of the venture money far more efficient mm -hmm. then you know you'll see sometimes talented people raise money and then they're kind of like spinning their wheels trying to find something to solve <clears throat> but if there's a pointed solution point to problem pointed solution the efficiency of of delivering something of value is a lot higher um one of my investors in treasure data was this young man eric yuan who ended up founding zoom and uh as i was talking about the cloud it, uh so he and i had both funded tango video as well eric had happened to be the vp of engineering at the founding of webex and then webex grew got public became a uh a uh, public company, and then Cisco bought it for three point four billion in cash. <clears throat> and then Eric stayed on inside. The rest of the team retired, and Eric stayed on, became the general manager, and grew Webex to about a, I think it was maybe six hundred million dollar a year business by twenty eleven when he helped write a little check to Treasure Data. And um, we were at an advisory board meeting that led to a discussion where uh, at Tango Video, where we were talking about uh, cloud and that led to another lunch and I was explaining to him why cloud would change everything and why he should write a check, a personal check to fund treasure data. And as he started to think about cloud, he said to me, he said, wow, this cloud could change everything. It, 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 could, it could completely wipe me out at WebEx. And, and I said, yeah, WebEx? Why would cloud, I'm thinking, why would cloud have any relevancy to video conferencing? Didn't, it didn't seem like, a, like an infrastructure kind of thing. <clears throat> and he explained to me that um, he was operating 13 or 14 software teams. And it was getting really complicated to maintain the architecture. And I was like, I said, 13 teams? Why do you have 13 teams for WebEx? I thought it was like one team. And he said, no, no, no. He said, you know, when you come to WebEx.com, I have to figure out, are you a Mac or are you a PC? What operating system do you have in that Mac? Which year? What browser are you using? What CPU do you have? How much memory do you have? And, and there's different versions. And so I have to figure out which version you have. And then when everybody's got their thing and they're connecting for a call all these things come to a server in, in, at cisco's cloud and then i have to figure out who has the worst quality computer and browser and old operating system and down rate everybody to that level otherwise that person can't see so i can always guarantee you the the worst quality in the largest group and he said wow somebody might like build something in the cloud where you can just add horsepower all the time and then the 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 client software just becomes like a skin he said it, it, it it'll kill me and I said well why couldn't you do that and six weeks later he called me asked me for lunch and I said are you starting a company and he said I think so I said well count me in I'll, I'll, I'll write a check and then I was a, that I was the first to commit to back zoom wow. so anyway so that uh that that number yeah, three billion of you know he he owned he owns a good chunk of the company i think it's now like 10. the company's worth about 45 50 billion now um who would have guessed the ramp that they'd be on recently in december the company was was uh running with around 10 million daily active users um because of the stay at home by march mid-march it was 200 million so they added, and they, their infrastructure was built for eight million. So, you know, they 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 literally twenty xed users in ninety days, and then uh, last week they they made a statement because they were doing a security webinar that it had grown to three hundred million. So they've added a hundred million new users, fifty percent growth in three weeks, uh, and the infrastructure has been working. You know, so and that tells you the beauty of a of a cloud. Uh, architecture where, as he described, you know, you you basically your your video comes in. You can have a streaming video. You can have a presentation, and 
if it needs to reach 50,000 users, servers light up in the cloud and it replicates. So it, in a client server model or in a Skype model, your browser has to compress it and then connect 50,000 times to different instances. It just doesn't work. So Skype is, you'll see, you know, like I think you've been all using Skype for your whole lives and you can only have like three people on it. And then the you know fourth, fifth person makes it crap out. <clears throat> so it's just you know a much better architecture that that Zoom has. Bill, one of your previous quotes about Zoom was "Don't be afraid of competition or a crowded segment." And this was when you first invested in Zoom. Every other investor was passing because they couldn't see the difference of Zoom. What's an example or advice would you give to founders so that they can stand out from competitors and actually help them see beyond sort of the surface? Yeah, that was a funny period because, you know, to me, because I was so, uh, you know, everything I was funding in that period was cloud design, Canva, cloud documents for OSHA compliance, safety culture, cloud Hadoop, cloud video, everything, cloud currency. And if you're, and to me, it was like so obvious. It was a, it was like the same, same transition from mainframes to mini computers to workstations and per PCs. It was obvious, but uh, because there were existing giants that, that had services for free, you know, Microsoft had bought Skype for eight and a half million billion dollars and was giving it away for free. And uh, uh, Google had Hangouts and it was free. And I think a lot of the venture people, irrespective of cloud, just didn't care because they were like, well, how do you compete with Google? <laughs> That's free. Right. You know, and, and I didn't have a good answer for that off in the very beginning, but I, I did have a sense that the guy knew what he was doing. It was a massive market and there was revenue flowing through that market in a big way because of the revenue streams from Citric, Citric systems in uh, GoToMeeting and WebEx and people paid for all these, you know, video conferencing systems. So, so when, after we seeded it and the company was running short of funds, we, we were very, very lucky that Jerry Yang had put some money into Treasure Data with me and Eric Yuan. And, uh, and Qualcomm had followed me into some other things, but um, we had introduced Zoom to these folks. And Jerry, I think, didn't want to deal with it because I think he also was thinking, well, how do you compete for free, you know, with free? So he kicked it down to a younger associate in managing his money who sent me this note saying, Bill, you know, we know you're not no dummy and you're doing a good job on this treasure data stuff. Why should we take this seriously? The engagement numbers are horrible because we had only had 20,000 downloads of Zoom and I think 50% of them used it once and never came back because there was no one else to connect to. You know, it was like test, test stuff. And, uh, and I wrote a four page email to reply to him that's on the internet. And I'll have to send you the link tip if you want to send it out. But, but I laid out a couple things. One was, it's a very big market. Two, this is a team that can iterate fast. Three, there's a structural change that will allow the emergence of a new leader. And, and that it was a, a space that obviously generated revenue and there was gonna be a transition to cloud mobile tablet and an opening uh, in use cases. And pretty much everything that I laid out in that email from 2011, it, it's come true. To the, to the revenue size. I mean, it's it's actually quite, it's just crazy that it's actually actually turned out the way I said it would turn out. But I, I will send that to you because it's a fun read. Um, yeah, definitely. And uh, this is the founding team of Wish. <clears throat> so uh, I should have put Wish first because I, I seeded Wish before Treasure Data and Zoom. Um, Peter, who you see on the left, he was also a seed investor in Treasure Data. Okay, so this was a case where they didn't, they, they thought they knew what they were going to do and did what they wanted to do, but had to pivot. So I backed this team because Peter was part of the Google AdSense team and Danny Zhang to his right. Danny was the inventor of paid search while he was at Overture. They got acquired by Yahoo and Google. Uh, sorry, Yahoo acquired Overture and then Google copied paid search to make AdSense. And uh, 
anyway, it uh, it was a fascinating thing because they were both brilliant people. And the company's name, the legal name of Wish is actually Context Logic, and you can see that on his shirt. And what that is, is basically they were applying data science, which was the area that I was really interested in, mm -hmm. uh, to contextual logic, contextual search. So what they did first was they built an ad network. And what this ad network did was it was higher performing, meaning that they would get context on the user looking at the ad network and they had a better sense of what to serve you. So the click rates, the click through rates and therefore the monetization was higher than uh, it would have otherwise been. And they did a really good job at that. They were like throwing billions of ads out there, but and the click rates were higher than everybody else, but they'd make like a penny an ad. So they could never get to really big revenue. And what they did was they started to realize, well, you know, we're helping other people get higher click through on their ads. Why don't we bolt something onto this? And instead of like a penny a click, what if we sold a $7 shoe on that click? And so they basically uh, created something that looks like a Pinterest with a buy button and used the same techniques that they were delivering to other customers to tune the products that you would see. So when you register for Wish, you come through Facebook uh, typically, and then they can scrape your profile, see all the things that you like, get a guesstimate on your age, your gender, preferences, and then serve you a bunch of ads uh, for products. And then as you buy, the system auto learns. And uh, interestingly enough, they built that on Treasure Data. So both Peter and Danny funded the seed of Treasure Data. They were our first customer, our first paying customer. And even as of last year, I think they were 17% of revenue. Uh, but it, it, uh, it's useful. And both of those companies, Treasure Data and Wish, were built from a human perspective on Zoom. So even at that time, we started the engineering operation uh, for Treasure Data in Japan. I, there's no way I could have started that company without Zoom. And Peter and Danny, same thing. You know, and and it, it's been an amazing little uh, you know kind of circle of we all you know co-invested in each other's companies, ran on mm -hmm. each other's products, and helped build um, such a successful outcome. So, wish I think their last round was uh, funded at eleven billion <clears throat> or so. It's a, you know it's a significant sized company now. They're basically eating away at Alibaba and Amazon. So, so if you think about what Alibaba did, Alibaba basically started in the um, kind of the advertising business per se, meaning that there used to be these booklets, catalogs called uh, Asian sourcing. And American manufacturers would fly to Hong Kong, look through this like book of, book of uh, manufacturers, and then contract them to make things. And Alibaba basically displaced that with web pages. So they created an online directory so people didn't have to fly over or look at the book and they could kind of see things. And then once there was traffic, they would place ads, meaning uh, suppliers that wanted presence could pay for better placement. And then once goods started flowing to that site, they started charging a fee for the marketplace. And what, what, uh, what Wish does is Wish basically displaces Alibaba in that segment. So as I said, it's like Pinterest with products. Any supplier can put up a picture of their stuff, post it, and then the American buyer or any other buyer where they operate you know, in, a, in a marketplace can come and click on that and buy directly and not have to go through Alibaba. So it's uh, yeah. it's it's working well. Um, you might recognize the the third. That, so let's see. This is Anna Campbell, um, the blonde person who was a... Uh, she was on a BBC TV show called Last Woman Standing. I, and I know this is not about her, but wonderful woman who was an athlete who had to learn local African uh, sports and compete with other women and like do things like stick fighting or whatever they would do until she won and she was the last woman standing. Standing next to her is Jesse Richmond's brother, Sean Richmond, a pro kiteboarder. There's Melanie Perkins and there's me. So I think... Many people have heard that story. You know, I came out to Western Australia to kiteboard in Perth and somehow, you know, I ended up running into Melanie Perkins through Larry Lopez and over a 
series of years, got to know her and, and ended up uh, deciding to back her and the community of our kite surfer entrepreneurs. And we all threw in some money and helped her, you know, build a little network and, and canvas Canva, you know, it's a great story, but uh, you guys have probably seen all these articles. I think they just, I, I forgot the last raise might've been at three and a half billion. Uh, it's in the, it's in like the low billions, but it's, you know, good, solid, profitable company. And, and the great companies, by the way, uh, they, they get profitable early. Like I think one of the reasons zoom has done well is that it's, it was the only really big IPO last year that of a company that was profitable, you know, mm -hmm. so Lyft and Uber and Pinterest and Casper and all these things, they were all basically losing money. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's no way that those, uh, those companies could really, uh, get the kind of attention that, that zoom did and Canva. Mm -hmm has been profitable for, for years, you know, really tightly run. A, a great question from um, one of the audience, Karim asked for pre-product and pre-traction companies, for example, with Canva in the early days where they pretty much had nothing to show for, how do you build confidence in those investments and the founders? Yeah, so so Melanie took me more than 15 minutes to write a check. <laughs> that, that, might, <laughs> that one might have been a couple, two or three years. I can't actually remember how many years it was, but it was, it was not a short period of time. What, uh, what happened there was uh, um, she had run a company before um, out of her mom's living room called Fusion Books. I think some of you have heard that story, which is basically a high school yearbook aggregation uh, play. So rather than uh, like traditional printing methods, she would basically digitize um, things through a web interface and be able to output things. And, and, and you know, I, I, I told her many years ago after I had funded her, I said, you know, Melanie, the vast majority of the companies that I funded, even if they've made it, they, they've never had a profit. You know, but, but she had learned how to make ends meet because she had to. And so here you have a scrappy entrepreneur who knew the segment really well. She had been taking design classes and teaching design, had clearly identified a very specific problem, um, mm -hmm. which was that Adobe Creative Suite or the various products you would use to, to do it with Adobe, one, they were really expensive. You would still buy them in boxes with a CD-ROM for thousands of dollars. And then to look, to know how to use them, you had to go take a class for six weeks and pay thousands of dollars to learn what all the buttons were, you know? So, so things have a way of kind of getting too complicated. And she just knew there was high value in the space. It had to get simplified. And to me, there was an opportunity to see it go on the cloud. And I, and I don't think that she was thinking cloud's going to change everything. She just wanted to make it easy. But I think uh, if there's a common theme across companies that I've funded, if you think about what digital does for people, it does it real. You really only have to do three things, for, from a product perspective, you lower the friction to usage. You take a common thing that people want to do and make it easy to do. That's number one. If you've done that, you architect it so it's replicable, so it's not just like a one-off, but it can be done for a lot of people. And then third, you have an infrastructure that allows it to scale. So if, if you can do all three of those, you know, low friction to use, easily replicable, easy to scale, then you have a shot if the market is big enough. That's exactly true of the purchasing decisions on Wish, the application of big data through the cloud on Treasure Data, what Canva does in design, what Zoom has done in video conferencing. It's all the same. So, uh, so I think I could see in her a, a scrappy entrepreneur, um, the ability to, to, to understand how to build a solution for a, a specific problem that she wanted to solve. There were, there were unknowns, of course, about her ability to lead and manage in that, at that time, because, you know, she was very young and, uh, and she's just evolved, you know, she's built a great, great team. Great. And another um, question that I had that I'd love for you to answer is one of Blackbird's values that I think you are such a great example of is we're comfortable with the misunderstood and early day Canva, early day Zoom, early day Bitfairy, you've all touched on this. 
these were not the typical Bay Area founder. So how do you get comfortable with the misunderstood? Is it something that's innate in you or is it a muscle that you've developed over time with investing? Uh, I, you know, I did have to develop that because it's, you know, when, when you start off as an investor, it's, it's sort of, you, you, you want to feel like you're right and you feel like you're right when everyone else feels like you're right too. You know, cause like when everyone's telling you're wrong, it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned over time is that the only time you can make money in public stocks or private ones in venture capital is in that off chance that you are right and everyone else is wrong. Because if everyone else is right and you're right at the same time, the price is really high. So even if it works, you just get your money back. Right. So so you have to be willing to go into areas that aren't over full, overly just overdone. And uh, and you have you have to be slightly early. You can't be too early. Otherwise, you, you burn money for a long time waiting. But you, you, you have to be a, a little bit ahead of the crowd. You have to be I wouldn't say a contrarian, but you have to be able to be an independent thinker. With your own sense of confidence. And believe me, every time, you know, every time I got turned down for additional money at Zoom, did it make me wonder, was I too early? Am I wrong? Of course. You know, when I had these founders that could hardly speak English at Treasure Data and I'm chairman, not the CEO, and people are like, Bill, we love you, but I don't know, those guys, I just don't know if they, they can sell. You know, did I think, oh, I should have, I should have had a stronger business team. Of course, you know, and Melanie. Is she too young? Does she know how to manage? Is it going to work in Perth, Australia? You know, because it's—I mean—it literally started in Perth. Of course, they've moved to Sydney now, but you know, I mean, Perth. Uh, you can build companies in Perth, and I have funded a company in Perth that's working called Power Ledger. You know, but at that time, it it wasn't clear. Rick Baker, same thing. You know, when uh, if you remember 10, 15 years ago, there there wasn't an early stage venture capital ecosystem in Australia. There was a little bit of like random angel seed money from individuals, but there were no series ABC firms to carry you along after that. And, you know, and I was, and when Rick said, I'm going to start a professional new early stage firm, I was like, well, you know what? I think this thing is going to broaden. And I was starting to see that I was building companies all over the place, not just in Silicon Valley, or not building them myself, but enabling the building of companies. So I thought thought it was all right. Great. Um, yeah. So so you know this is a this is a less so true now. I think you know last few years, really noisy environment, right? So I think with uh, the startup startup cycles are they they come and go. You know, like there's a flurry of activity. There's a ton of activity in 97 98 99 then it peaked and then you know then it was quiet for a while and uh this is maybe an older slide but you you have to be able to focus on a couple of things it it, it um life i think life and investing is really it's actually a lot simpler than people make it out to be a lot of people spin their wheels on a lot of unnecessary stuff and i think People ask me like, Bill, how do you get all these things done? You work on so many things. How's it possible? And I think I've just learned over time to, to ignore, to really be careful about deciding what's signal and what's noise. And if you apply your energy efficiently to the things that matter, you'll do fine. So, and then. Okay. More about um, the signal when everyone's telling you that, you know, you're wrong, what are the core fundamental values that you go back to, to recalibrate? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I think it's the same thing. Uh, it, it's really market timing and size. Be and, and because, you, and so, and I've, I've used it, I've, I've said this in some talks before too. It's a, it's a little bit like surfing, right? And, and probably 90% of the people on this webinar have tried to surf. And you will know that feeling where you're on the board paddling around and there's only three places you can be. You can be in front of the wave on the wave, behind the wave. And if you're behind the wave, 
you absolutely know there is no possible way to swim up the back and get in front and there's going to be other people on it so you're too late so you can't be behind a market you have to be in front of it but if you're way too far in front and you're paddling too hard too fast then and the wave never doesn't hit you by the time it gets there you're you're burned out and there's somebody else on it you know so there's this phrase being early is a lot like being wrong because it is and so and then there's that magical moment where every once in a while you paddle once and that's all you had to do and you're going and you're like oh i am up you know and so so it's really about oscillating you know or like you know foot on the gas foot on like off the gas you're moving forward but you can't move forward too fast with too high a burn you have to kind of hang there until the timing is right that's that's a, a perfect example is canva Melanie would have started that company 10 years earlier if she if anybody had given her the money, but no one would. You know, so it really took her kind of like her force of nature with the wave coming to fuel her up just before that wave started to carry her. And then it was an economically important wave and she was able to drive a profit. Zoom was a little bit on the early side. You know, it it, it took years before they could kind of break through in a crowded market. And finally show we are different. We are better. That you should use there's a reason to use this, even though everything else is free. You know, but it, it took it took a while. Treasure data was timed pretty well. I mean, I was a little late on that one, you know, but but uh not too late. You know, we were able to get in the market. But when I when I funded those guys, I said, I I I will guarantee you in five to seven years, there's gonna be five companies worth a billion dollars each. And I was right, you know, whether it was Splunk or Sumo Logic or whatever. And we were a little bit smaller than those guys, but we, we used far less money and we were a much higher return than any of the other ones. Great. We have um, time for just one more question. An audience member asked, in an economic downturn, there tends to be more barriers for startups to fundraise. What's your advice for early stage founders to overcome this crisis? Uh, you know, uh, again, it's stay with the fundamentals. You you want to be, I, I think I, there are people that like funding in these these environments like like me you know but um uh it, it's really important to know yeah so back to the melanie example the clearer you are solving a real problem um and ha having the ability to bring great team to that and knowing how you're going to execute so that you're not just spinning your wheels that that matters in environment. So so crispness of execution matters, especially in a period like this. When things are frothy, sometimes venture people will just experiment on good people and provide capital, hoping the team will stumble into something. You know, but I think in times like this, pointed execution and timing matter. Great. Well, thank you so much, Phil. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for making time and sharing your insights. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, you are now off to the Startmate room for a private Q&A. Everyone else, I will see you at Justin's session starting at 9 a.m. Australian Eastern time for actionable advice around building a strong culture and boosting morale in an uncertain world. Thanks again, guys. <laughs>